uh, it, nothing's going to work if you inject it in the knee uh, with a right. uh, fluid that's uh, not yeah. uh, normal. Right. Well, let's get started here. So I'd like to oh. continue. John, do you have something else you want to say? Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the critical concepts which have to do with uh, the knee uh, as a risk for uh, cartilage injury. Uh, talked about the anatomy of force transfer between the diaphysis, metaphysis, and the epiphysis, the critical role of trabecular bone injury in support of the subchondral plate. Then we'll talk about mechanism of trabecular bone healing and importance of the subchondral plate. So the, the body force comes down to the knee through the uh, cort primarily the cortex of the of the uh, 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 diaphysis, uh, about ninety five percent of the body weight in the diaphysis is transmitted through the cortex, and only about five percent through the trabecular bone. Uh, when you get down, that reverses by the time you get down to the actual articular surface, whereas the bulk of the weight is actually transmitted through the trabecular bone and the epiphyseal. Uh, and a transition zone in the metaphysis of the of the femur, and why why is that important? Well, if you think of the bone weight, the cortical bone is nice and strong and sturdy, especially if it's compressed longitudinally. Uh, but when you get down where you have articular cartilage, uh, that amount of uh, pressure uh, that, like you get in the cortex, the articular cartilage can't handle that without tearing. So what happens is. Uh, this uh, the knee was designed so that you could distribute the body weight uh, through a broad uh, cross-sectional area. So if you have a given force, the amount of pressure to transmit that force uh, down to the ground uh, <clears throat> depends upon the surface area over which you distribute it. If you double the surface area, the pressure for the same force is cut in half. So by, by doing this, you actually have a large surface area where the force of the body can be transmitted through the articular cartilage to the tibia. And then you can see the reverse anatomy occurs once you're in the tibia. So this was developed through evolution to protect the articular cartilage of the patella. So there's a thick diaphyseal cortex, a very thin epiphyseal cortex, because now the weight has been shifted to the trabecular bone. Okay, and the therefore the trabecular bone is really the critical bone involved when it comes to transmitting the force to the articular cartilage. So when you have a subchondral injury like we see here, where the trabecular bone is uh, fractured immediately adjacent to the articular cartilage, then this part of the articular cartilage uh, no longer is going to get the, well, if you, you no longer, you have forces that go through the, the, the bone and articular cartilage here, but now the subchondral bone is no longer able to uh, support the trabecular bone, and you'll get impaction uh, uh, with the trabecular bone. You also get decreased vascularity in this area, and over time, if it's chronic, you'll get decreased nutrient supply to the articular cartilage. Uh, but the, the biggest factor is probably one where you have a subchondral trabecular injury like this of mechanical injury to the overlying articular cartilage. And this has, shown, has been shown to have a high risk uh, for being a precursor to the development of chondromalacia of the overlying articular cartilage. So the subchondral bone fractures like this are high-risk fractures. When you see these, it's uh, I would describe it in your report, or even uh, especially if it's a high-level athlete, call and make sure that the referring physician is aware that this is a high-risk lesion. Trabecular injuries up here or in the metaphysis uh, aren't nearly as dangerous for the articular cartilage. John, has anybody tried to uh, do an imaging on a standing patient uh, in a condition like this? Yes. With the upright MR scanners, uh, we can certainly do that, and we've done that in the past. What did that show in terms of any difference in the uh, cartilage? Uh, 
Well, at the, I've not done any acute subcondral fractures like this to see whether there's any difference between upright and uh, weight-bearing and non-upright to see if there's any motion of the subchondral bone. But what we've done is follow patients like this uh, and uh, over time, and it is associated with the development of, of articular cartilage lesions. Now, a lot yeah, of, I understand. Yeah, a lot of clinicians will use patient's pain as the marker. If the patient's not painful, they'll go ahead and allow weight-bearing. If the patient is painful, then they uh, take them off. But that's very variable as to how this information is used by the clinician, as you know, John. Okay. Natalia, what do you see here? Um... So, on, on this side, there's like a subchondral, okay. like... So, so what we see here in the medial femoral condyle in the subchondral bone is a lot of edema. Mm -hmm. And the setting of acute trauma, which this is, that almost always is associated with trabecular fracture and hemorrhage mm -hmm. into to the bone there. We also see a little bit of signal in homogeneity here of the articular cartilage and maybe a little bit of thinning right over it. So I'd be concerned about an injury to the cartilage, uh, which we see there. Okay, so now the this is 12306. Now the patient has come back on 5406. What what do you see different here? Uh, so um, more edema. Uh... Okay, like, so uh, so what we see is the edema may be brighter right around the injury, mm -hmm. but the volume of the bone edema is probably less. Mm -hmm. So it's changed. And then with the articular cartilage? Uh, it's um, thinner on this side. Okay, so now we can see there's a full thickness defect. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look here, there's actually an impaction area of the subgondral bone where it's been mm -hmm. impacted here whereas it's still normal configuration over here. So this is a... Was this, uh, I'm sorry, was this patient non weight bearer? I don't know. My assumption is that the patient was weight-bearing, John, but I, I don't know. Uh, and that, would, that would be pretty painful. But the patient came back to be imaged because of increasing pain. So yeah. uh, that's okay, why... I so it was ambulating. I think it's important to uh, let clinicians know that these are high-risk lesions. Well, the pain itself should tell them that not, not the weight there. Yeah. Casey? 12-year-old giving out positive blood. Okay, so I think we're looking at the medial femoral condyle, there's a subchondral impaction injury uh, with edema. So there's and, an, certainly edema there, right? Yeah, the overlying cartilage looks grossly intact. Okay, all right. So this was on 7-1406, where we can see that. And on the sagittal images, this is what it looks like. Same patient, same date. All right, so there is some uh, collapse of the subchondral uh, bone right there. A little bit here, a little yeah. bit of subchondral cyst. So that, certainly that subchondral plate is not normal, so it's been injured. Yeah. And again, we've talked about this several times before, but let me just reiterate it here. If you have uh, a force against the cartilage, the cartilage is very malleable. It, it can be deformed without tearing, as long as it's uh, not too severe. Whereas a subchondral bone, this is very rigid bone, and if it deforms, you have to fracture the, the trabecular bone. So these are probably subchondral fractures, which we have here. Uh, but that damages that subchondral plate, which is very important for the mechanical integrity of the cartilage, as well as part of the nutrient supply of the cartilage. Uh, okay, so this is on 71406. Now we see the subchondral injury. So now the patient comes back a few years later. All right, so 
looks like that uh, area of impaction has progressed and then there's some fluid uh, interposed between the uh, cartilage and the bone there. So I'd be worried that it's an unstable fragment. Yeah, if we go back here, we can see that, whoops, sorry about that. We can actually see that there's kind of uh, uh, dense bone formation on either side fluid in between, edema on either side, so that's highly suspicious for an unstable bone fragment. But still, we still have intact overlying articular cartilage. So so this is kind of a chronic subchondral fracture. John? That's still fixable uh, with, um, I used to use nails, but um, they have nice tiny screws now that you can use. Um, to put that uh, so it doesn't fall into the joint and you can save save that area uh, from other problems down the road. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting about this commentary was from a Lachman test was positive. Uh, every 12 year old that I've ever tested, uh, and I tested the normal side and the abnormal side had a po positive Lachman test. Okay. So twelve-year-olds are notorious for that. John, would you, would you tell everybody what a Lachman test is? Lachman test is just you, you have a patient supine on a table, you flex the knee to twenty to thirty degrees, and then you hold your hand underneath the proximal tibia and the distal femur, and you take the tibia and try to uh, pull it up uh, away from the femur and uh, a certain amount of give uh, occurs in that situation. And if it's too much, it's abnormal. Um, I don't think it's- there's And you're that testing much for the ACL, to... right? That's a test for ACL. But there's no, not, not much difference with a, with a regular uh, anteroposterior uh, test, uh, just with a knee 90 degrees. Okay. So uh, the Lachman test didn't give me much more information than, than uh, just a, sitting on the patient's foot with a dinghy at 90 degrees. There's another test also that's uh, been used at 45 degrees of flexion. Okay. Um, ne Nicholas, I think, was his name. Um, okay. But that's... okay, so so this the the old term for this is osteochondritis desiccans, and. A couple of decades ago, there was a big debate about whether this is osteonecrosis from bone infarct or not. But now we've seen a number of these progress in this particular case, and it's very clear these are subchondral fractures and uh, that, that aren't allowed to heal properly, uh, where the, uh, they continue, they start weight bearing and putting pressure on it when the trabecular bone is still not healed. And that can, can lead to progressive injury and eventually to a subchondral. Uh, inside to fragment like this. The chances are that there is motion in that area. Uh, if you did a trochopic uh, procedure, you probably find that, that there is some motion of that fragment. So what you do, want to do is um, fix it so that uh, it gets a blood supply. That fragment does not have a blood supply. Right. So we have a 24-year-old male trauma four years ago. This looks kind of similar to the last case. There's a edema in that medial femoral condyle with fluid undercutting that osteochondral uh, fragment there. Okay, so this is on 10-21-2011. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to a few months later, and this is what it looks like a few months later. Uh, so looking at that PD fat image, I don't see that fragment anymore, so I'd be concerned it's well, displaced. The patient, the patient didn't, wasn't taken care of. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, so, where'd the fragment go? Uh, looking at that left image, it looks like it's, yeah, out there in that lateral superior recess. But if you'll notice, uh, these are on the medial side, so mm -hmm. uh, that's important to, to remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the natural progression of these subchondral injuries uh, if they're not properly treated. Yeah, you know, you've lost your chance 
right from the get-go. It probably would have been much better earlier as soon as the patient injured and they, uh, right. if it was taken care of on weight bearing, maybe a splint or cast, it probably would have saved the knee. Right. Uh, but obviously this patient wasn't treated or was, uh, I've had patients take their uh, splints off. Uh, then I put them in a cast to make sure that they don't take that off. But some, some would do that. Okay. They would take their cast off. Right. And the parents wouldn't do anything. Yeah. So, um, Unfortunately, I don't remember a single patient that, that developed uh, a subchondral problem where I couldn't fix it. Good. So it's a 12-year-old tennis player with chronic bilateral knee pain. Uh, so there's, I don't know if it's like edema or... Yeah, that. so we see this, these are PD-FATSAT images. So this is high signal intensity on fluid sensitive images. Uh -huh. And it's really in the subchondral bone here on the axial and the coronal plane. If we go to the sagittal plane, it looks like this. Mm-hmm. So what do you think is going on here? Uh, so on the uh, posterior part, yeah, uh, there's like um, it's like the the cartilage is like irregular. Okay. Well, the cartilage is here. Oh, the subcartilage the looks like it's pretty much intact still, uh -huh. but the subchondral bone is injured here, mm -hmm. right? Like we've been talking about. So that's a and the subchondral injury. So these are, uh, I think these lesions are not uncommon. It's just in the old days, we never picked them up at earlier stages because the x-rays are going to be negative for this. And uh, it's important to recognize the, the risk that these can play. Okay. All right, chronic subchondral injury. So it looks like it's involving the far posterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle right and so this is similar to the last case but this is more severe it wasn't picked up early and was allowed to progress what you see here and this one is on the lateral side isn't it john this is on the lateral side right and these kind of posterior images are relatively common to tennis players we talked about the reason why on the last lecture and then here's another so subchondral injuries, in this case on uh, kind of on both sides, which we can see there. And here, if you go in arthroscopically, uh, there's a nice ACL, articular cartilage of the femur. And uh, here we can see a little bit of irregularity of that, uh, of that articular cartilage. So here's... A little the bit of irregularity becomes a bigger one. That's the problem with it. Yeah. Once you see that uh, uh, fuzzy looking stuff, uh, that, that, that means trouble. Okay. Okay. All right. So, history says impaction fracture. And does it look like there's an impaction fracture of that lateral femoral condyle? Awesome. So, <clears throat> So these are more progressive uh, traumatic injuries. We can see, actually see that the subchondral bone is impacted here. And we can see a fracture of the trabecular bone uh, around where the injury has occurred. And notice how we have now have kinking of the articular cartilage overlying a very sharp fragment of bone right here. Uh, that's uh, uh, another major risk factor for cartilage uh, disease, uh, which we see here. In this particular case, here is a similar case on a low field scanner. Uh, just got a nice follow up on this one where we can see depression of the fracture of the tibial plateau. And if we followed over time uh, in, in 8 1701, we didn't have any bone edema. Now, a couple of, a year and a half later, you can see bone edema on both sides. The bone is pretty much healed. Uh, but even though this is a low field scanner, unfortunately, this patient had uh, full thickness cartilage losses on both sides uh, in this location at arthroscopy. So this is typically what occurs. The, the, this 
hard bony uh, edge here will tear into the articular cartilage. Then with uh, normal walking and wear and tear and sports activities, if you're in sports, it uh, widens the degree of injury to the articular cartilage. This prominent uh, uh, bony ridge will also cause injury to the opposite side and you'll end up with uh, uh, degenerative joint disease. Okay. I'll tell you, this was an NBA All-Star. I think, I think he played for, either played for Denver at this time and was traded to Dallas or the other way around. But anyway. Okay. Um. So what we see here, this is a T1 weighted image on an old scanner. Mm -hmm. And what we see here is loss of signal intensity, which means on a T1 weighted image, that usually means there's increased fluid in that area. So this is an area of edema on an old fashioned T1 weighted image. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, and then here, four weeks later, uh, at the initial study, we couldn't see a defect in the bone. Four weeks later, and this patient was need when he was going up for a layup in a game. Uh, uh, other images showed the subchondral bone intact. Four weeks later, and by the way, he's kind of started practicing again. We can see that there's this focal impacted area like we've seen before, very characteristic of these lesions. Most of the bone edema has resolved, but now we just have a focal impacted fracture really of the subchondral bone and a full thickness defect of the articular cartilage. Over the next year, he had about 12 MR scans. This was a year later, and now we can actually see that there's some try attempted healing of this uh, impacted fracture, but there's still impacted fracture on this T1-weighted image, maybe developing a little bit of hibernation next to it, some degenerative disease. And uh, he was traded to one of the other teams and uh, practiced for a few weeks, but was unable to play in another game. So this was a case where it might well have happened if, if we'd recognized and I didn't see the case till later, I was recognized the importance of the subchondral injury and the patient had been taken out of practice, maybe it wouldn't have gone on to impaction, and, and, but uh, uh, we don't know. But if the subchondral bone is intact and the cartilage is intact and you just have bone edema, I think the prognosis of those is very good if you can protect the bone to allow it to heal first. But we don't, I don't know of any big series that have proven that. Well, the initial injury, uh, um, if, if you look at it at the time of the injury, as I mentioned in, a, in a class, um, th there is far more uh, deformity uh, during the act of injury uh, with a force than what you, what you get when you look at a patient lying down and taking an MRI. So. Yeah. Right. Um, which, what you're looking at now is something that has already tried try to get back into normal shape. Uh, yes. So you have to assume that there is much more um, injury than, than what you see on the MRI. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this was back in around 1990. We didn't have fat suppressed images in those days. So this is just a T1, an old fashioned T2. And a gradient echo, and this is when we stopped using gradient echoes because we just couldn't get the contrast. Okay. All right. Looks like we have uh, axial, sagittal T twos. Um, there's a focal full thickness defect uh, of the cartilage at the medial trochlea. Yeah, and we can see it's very long kind of thin, but very long here. This is on 4108, there it is. Now we go to a couple years later. All right, so looks like there's been a subchondral osseophyte formation. Okay, good. So what we see now in that area where we had the cartilage defect, 
we now have a subchondral osteophyte. Notice this patient's had arthroscopy in between. Now, uh, subchondral osteophytes, when you go in, almost always, if there's any tissue overlying it, it's just going to be a fibrous sheet. It almost always means that you have complete full thickness loss of the articular cartilage. And again, if you remember discussions that we've had in multiple lectures, uh, cartilage and other soft tissues like tendons don't like to heal very well, but bone loves to heal. So if you get irritation here of the bone, uh, some people are very good bone formers and they develop these osteophytes where the bone is trying to grow in and heal the lesion. And so these are subchondral osteophytes and they're a pretty good marker of extensive chronic grade 4 chondromalacia. And the proud lesion. Proud, that's right. So, and here's a paper looking at subchondral osteophytes. Uh, or central osteophytes, some people call them. They're preceded by focal structural and degenerative change of the cartilage, typically full thickness cartilage loss, and uh, they tend to be uh, symptomatic. Another uh, higher field system, we can see a subchondral osteophyte, again, with marked thinning of the overlying articular cartilage. Very typical of subchondral osteophytes. Whoops. Oh. Yeah, this just shows standard imaging and standard PDNT2. If we go to 3D imaging and we get very thin cuts, we can actually see the, the bone, the subchondral osteophyte much better. Again, it just shows that for uh, a lot of these lesions, if, you, if we actually could, in a reasonable amount of time with good signal to noise, do 3D imaging, uh, we can pick up a few things. One of the problems with 3D imaging when you do it uh, is you end up with a lot of images to look at. It's, so it's kind of like a callus, John. Yeah, right. Yeah. So a lot of people uh, uh, prefer not to do the 3D imaging, even, but uh, we've stopped doing them primarily because uh, they're, they tend to be very noisy, even at, th at 3T with most of the techniques we have. But if we really want to do morphologic imaging of the cartilage, it really requires 3D imaging, I think. So let's talk about chondromalacia. So the standard classification and the one that most of our orthopedic surgeons around here uh, use is the outer bridge classification. It's really an arthroscopic classification, uh, not an MR classification. Grade one is where you have discoloration of the overlying cartilage. And if you press it with the probe, it's, it's uh, not firm. Uh, grade two, you get surface erosions, but they're not deep. Grade three, you have deep fissures, but you don't see the underlying bone. Grade four, you can see the underlying bone exposed. John, do you want to say anything about this classification? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the way uh, outer birth uh, yeah. Row uh, was uh, zero was normal cartilage, um, okay. and then uh, one softening and swelling, uh, two fragmentation and fissure in area less than zero point five inches in diameter, and number three was fragmentation and fissure in an area larger than point five inches in diameter, and four was exposed subchondral bone. That's how outer bridge uh, classified it. And then there was a modified outer bridge. Uh, zero is uh, intact cartilage. Uh, one is chondral softening up or blistering with intact surface. So, uh, two was superficial ulceration, fibrillation, or fissuring less than 50% of depth of cartilage. Three, deep ulceration, fibrillation, fissuring, or chondral flap, more than 50% of cartilage without exposed bone, and four, full thickness, where with exposed subchondral bone. There's another classification, but I, there's no reason to go there. Yeah, well, I'm going to go through a bunch of others here just so that people are exposed to them. One thing to remember that you've seen already is you can have bone changes 
with no chondromalacia. So a lot of uh, some of the fellow, the, some of the residents that come here, well, whenever they see subchondral bone, they immediately say it's grade four chondromalacia. That's not necessarily the case, as we've seen here. You can have completely normal cartilage with abnormal underlying bone. Uh, so to actually grade four chondromalacia, you have to actually see that there is uh, a full thickness defect in the articular cartilage. You can't just infer it because you have subchondral bony edema. And then there's, let me, I'm going to go through a few other classifications here just so you're aware of them. The only one we use in clinical practice is the outer bridge classification. For research purposes, there's the International Cartilage Repair Society classification. It's very similar to the outer bridge classification. Uh, you have grades one and two, fibrillation or softening. And then uh, grade 1B, you can actually have fissure, uh, laceration or very, very superficial fissuring. Grade 2, you get defects uh, with, within the, the articular cartilage, which are less than 50% of the thickness of the cartilage. Grade 3 defects greater than 50% of the thickness. And then grade 4 is exposed bone again. There's the ORC. That's, class a, that's the one that I wasn't going to talk about. Uh, the reason being is there's no reason to have it. What's 50% of thickness? That's hard to figure out. Um, arthroscopically, you wouldn't be able to say. Right. Yeah, I've always wondered that. But this is a arthroscopic classification system. The percent thickness, we can kind of see by MR. But again, I don't know of any studies that have actually shown the accuracy of MR at differentiating less than or greater than 50% thickness. And then there's the uh, ORSI classification, Arthritis Research Society International. Uh, zero is a surface intact, like all of them. Grade one, intact with edema, similar to uh, outer bridge. Grade two, there's some surface discontinuity, similar to outer bridge. Grade three, there are vertical fissures. Grade four, you have actually erosions. Grade five, you actually have denudation. You can actually see the bone. And grade six, you have deformity of the bone as well. Uh, Camels doesn't go in for that one. Yeah. There's the worms classification, which is more of an imaging classification, really designed for magnetic resonance imaging by uh, the osteoporosis and arthritis research group. Grade zero is normal thickness. Grade one is increased signal intensity on T2, so edema, which would be similar to uh, outer bridge classification. Grade two, partial thickness focal defect. Grade 2.5, full thickness focal defect. So that's very, that differs significantly from outer bridge. Grade three, you have multiple injuries of partial thickness uh, uh, defects. Grade four, uh, diffuse partial thickness loss. Grade five, multiple areas of full thickness loss. And then grade six is diffuse loss. So this is primarily for doing articular cartilage research with MR where you're trying to intervene and seeing if there's any progression of change uh, in these cases. But I don't think uh, I don't think this is used very often outside of some research. And there's a MOKS classification, the MRI on osteoarthritis knee score. Uh, they, they talk more about size, you know, there's no lesion, less than 10% of the articular cartilage surface area, between 10 and 75, and then basically most of the cartilage area. And then uh, uh, if you just have a partial loss of articular cartilage, you, you, you either have full thickness or partial thickness tears, uh, just so that you're aware of the other classifications. I think we've already talked about this, uh, where uh, people looked at uh, focal areas of signal abnormality, and they found over a two-year period, if you follow these, all of them will lead to uh, be associated with uh, cartilage loss. So we already talked about that. Okay, let's see who's next. Okay. Yeah, so looks like there is a surface fraying and the signal changes to the uh, Okay. Patellar cartilage, probably grade two. Yeah, and if you guess, it's probably not 50% of the thickness. Yeah. So this was grade two. 
And this one is associated with a shallow trochlear groove, so it may be associated with some patellar instability that leads to increased trauma to the articular cartilage. Okay. Robert. All right, so we have a 53-year-old female with medial knee pain for six months uh, from a documented meniscal tear. Uh, here, looking at the uh, patellofemoral cartilage, it looks, again, irregular, and there's some uh, fissuring probably there. So this is PD, this is T2, so we don't actually see a full defect with fluid going into it. Uh, now with the T2 cube, we get thinner cuts, so we can actually see the fluid actually going in through the full thickness defect down to the bone. Mm -hmm. So you know, if, you're, if it's really important, we can see much better morphological information from T2 cube. Again, we, we basically found that Right now, that information is not really of clinical relevance. And uh, we try to standardize our protocols. A lot of our scanners really can't do the 3D imaging very well. So we've kind of standard to, standardized to 3 skip 0.5 uh, 2D imaging uh, now. But if you go out and practice, especially if you're dealing with uh, modern uh, high-quality scanners and you're dealing with... Uh, a sophisticated orthopedic group, you really might want to consider doing 3D, uh, 3D imaging. And here we can see the defect on the axial T2. And this was, was grade 3 chondromalacia. You know, I would probably call it grade 4, but at arthroscopy, it was grade 3. Okay. And this is a one Tesla scanner. So a lower field. So what do we see there? So we see a little bit of fluid where there should be articular cartilage. Mm -hmm. It's right on the this is a stir sequence on the right, and this is a T1 on the left. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little signaling homogeneity, but it'd be hard to call that. But on the stir, we can see that it's a definite abnormality. If we go to the sagittal, here are further coronal images, and here are sagittal images. Mm -hmm. We can see that there are a number of really what look like probably full thickness defects going down to the to the subchondral bone, mm -hmm. uh, the calcified layer anyway. At arthroscopy, this is what the normal side looks like. Nice, smooth articular cartilage. Here we see a normal little irregularity of the free edge of the meniscus. Uh, on the abnormal side, what do you see here? Uh, like um, irregularities of the cartilage. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of fibrillation mm -hmm. and tearing of that free edge. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of kind of fibrillation of the articular cartilage as well here. Mm -hmm. And some areas of deep fissuring of the articular cartilage. Subchondral femoral areas, probably a grade three to four. Yeah, so the arthroscopy is called this grade three at that particular time. So if we go back on these scanners, uh, I we call this, I tend to call this now grade three to four, because it does look like there may be a little bit of stuff here. But my, I would have thought that there would have been some focal areas of grade four here. Mm -hmm. uh, but at arthroscopy, this was all grade three. When you get three or four, probably doesn't make any difference, John. Yeah, they tend to be treated the same. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. <clears throat> all right, so looks like we have a near full thickness to full thickness chondral defect, uh, median patellar ridge, uh, yeah. extending into medial patellar facet. Yeah, so on the PD, it looks like there may be some cartilage here. I mean, the T2, it may be some cartilage. Actually, this is PD. These are old scans. This is a T2-weighted sequence where it looks like there's certainly high signal intensity going down close to the bone here. So I'd say this was three to four. Yeah. Here on the sagittal images, we can see a deep, deep fissure there. Now, let's go to the 3D, and this is basically the next cut over. We don't really see much, so it looks like it's, it's 
uh, kind of a deep fissure there. If we go to the 3D images, then if we start at one side, yeah, that's the center of the lesion. It looks very similar to the th three yeah. millimeter thick. But then if we start going, we can see multiple images showing the extent of the cartilage yeah. injury, which we really couldn't appreciate on the three millimeter skip point five. And you can also see here on these images that there is still some delamination of the articular cartilage over a much wider area. And remember, when you debreed these, you debreed down to stable articular cartilage, so you can see why this lesion is going to, after you debreed it, is going to be much larger than you might have anticipated if you just looked at the at the MR image. So again, if you're uh, working with someone, and then on the axial images, we can actually see that it's a, a larger lesion here. So we could we could really map it out better on the cube. So if you Working with someone who's really interested in cartilage and does a lot of cartilage surgery, uh, the, the, then you may want to work with uh, 3D imaging. What's interesting about the T2 on that uh, last one, John, is it's on, uh, the problem is on the medial side, not the lateral side where the most of the pressure is. Uh, that last one. Yep. Right. This one, yeah. So. Uh, uh, you would think it, it would be where the pressure is uh, rather than uh, where the non-pressure is. So uh, the, 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 you can argue that the uh, area that there is no pressure um, uh, can produce countermalacia uh, as well as uh, a, pre a place where there is no pressure. Yeah, well, this is the extended knee. As you know, John, I understand, you don't get pressure on it when you start to flex the knee. The right. areas of contact change. Well, uh, the, the, knee, uh, the kneecap moves from uh, superior medial to, to the center uh, and then to lateral and uh, to medial, and both both of them are affected. So yeah. there's a motion of the patella it doesn't go just straight down and up like like a hinge. So it's, it, it's a movement uh, yeah. uh, like a snake. So this comes under fracture with, with flexion, right? Right. Okay, whoops, here we go. Let's see who's next, Robert? Yeah. Uh, so we have a 41-year-old female with anterior knee pain. Uh, looking at things. Actually, let me take this one because this is a little bit irre irrelevant now. This was a, using a gradient echo technique. The cartilage looks great. At one time, people like using gradient echo. They were very fast, and you could get 3D imaging very nicely with it. But here's the T2, and you can see there are multiple fissures here. Maybe one you can pick up with a gradient echo, but we found that many of them were missed, so we kind of stopped, stopped doing that. You need some pressure on and off on, on the knee uh, to get circulation. So, um, like you mentioned that before, um, yeah. you have diffusion due to pressure and then the release of pressure. Right. So uh, the, the area that doesn't get all the pressure and release of pressure may be a problem because just of that reason. Okay. It's just not stimulated. Right, it doesn't, it gets malnourished. Right. So here's an arthroscopic image of a large lesion here in the, the femoral condyle. This was on 10 10 1998. Here is after they debreeded the, the cartilage, or mostly debreeded the cartilage. And here we can see the irregularity of the underlying bone. And what they did here then is a microfracture technique, which you guys heard about, or you didn't, Natalie, but these guys heard about in a recent lecture, you basically put an ice pick and you put pick in it in order to do that to get bleeding into that area. Uh, and this is with the tourniquet on. You put a tourniquet above the knee so you don't have bleeding at the time you do the surgery. If you release the tourniquet, then you get bleeding into this particular area. So this is a microfracture technique. Uh, and here's an MR scan that we see here. This is, uh, these are just T1-weighted images. Uh, uh, at, at this point, we can see a lot of irregularity of the subcondral bone. Uh, 
Uh, this is a, after a few years after microfracture, and we can see still there's a lot of abnormal subchondral bone there. If we go to the stir images, and this is a 0.3 Tesla scanner, so they're different. This is a, 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 a one Tesla scanner. Here, there's actually fluid going all the way down to the bone. We didn't see any cartilage here. Uh, this was three years after the microfracture. You can see that there is some soft tissue overlying the bone here. So originally, when they did the microfracture, it was thought that this you would get growth of this fibrocartilage overlying the defect, but it probably wouldn't last more than a year or two. Then a lot of studies showed that it actually ended up lasting four or five years, and it tended to have a better prognosis than, than doing nothing. Uh, now, as you know from recent lectures, uh, uh, compared to the more modern techniques, uh, which we'll talk about later, uh, <clears throat> of grafting and so forth, the microfracture technique does very poorly. So it's really not recommended anymore for weight-bearing joints like the knee. Okay. So, Natalia. Uh, what do you think about the, the cartilage over here? Mm. Um, so it looks like irregular compared to the other. Yeah, it looks like it's thick here, but there's a here we have more universal uniform uh -huh. cell intensity. Here it's very spotty. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if we go to the, this is a 0.3 Tesla, I mean a 1 Tesla scan. If we go to the stir image, this is what it looks like. So what's happening here? There's like um, subchondral edema. Right, so we see subchondral edema here. Uh -huh. And uh, defect, the cartilage. So we see abnormal signal within the cartilage here, mm -hmm. uh, edema within the cartilage. And it looks like there may be some fluid here at the junction between the uh, deep layers of the articular cartilage and the calcified zone mm -hmm. uh, down here. And if we go to other images, we can see more of these deep fissures. Uh, and uh, at arthroscopy, this was a grade four. You can see through the fissures, and this was delamination where the cartilage had separated from the underlying bone. Mm -hmm. And all that has to be debrided uh, if you're going to go in and do a graft. Mm -hmm. uh, so the size of the lesion is actually much larger than you might have thought otherwise. Mm -hmm. I always try to uh, non weight bear these patients, or you should and see what happens in a couple of months and then do the procedure. Good. I, I, I don't think I should operate right away on these people. All right, so it looks like uh, lateral trochlea, we have a full thickness chondral defect. Okay, so 9 11, 2012. Yeah, and then we can see the subchondral edema here on the coronal PD fat sat. Okay, so this is on 9-11-2012, and now the patient uh, can, has come back about six months later, and this is what it looks like. So there's definitely been progression of that uh, defect that spans a larger uh, like longitudinal area, and uh, is, yeah. I don't know if the subchondral edema is more pronounced, but it's definitely evolved. It's not... Yeah. 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 What, what do you think this would feel like when you examine this patient and put your hand over the knee and have them flex and extend? Um, I think that with flexion, he'd probably experience pain. Uh, no, you'd have it, it sounds like gravel. You can hear it across the uh, hallway. Uh, I examined uh, Will Chamberlain, Chamberlain a couple of times at dinner at the friend's house, and uh, uh, both his knees were when you examined them, they they sounded like uh, uh, like a train going over. Uh, 
tracks that are not gravel. smooth. Gravel, right. Okay, so this is 118, 2013. Now the patient came back six months later and it looks like this. All right, so the region of full thickness, cartilage loss is still there, uh, but the edema has cooled down. Yeah. Um, that's a post-op knee. It's a post-operative knee. Okay. And here we can see the defect. And so this just became a progressive grade four lesion, which increased in size. Okay. Yeah, this is in 2013. Uh, now, nowadays, uh, especially for a, a player like this, I think they would do a osteochondral graft. Well, they're, they're, it kind of changes from, from year to year. But whether you just put in a cartilage graft or do an osteochondral graft, at this point it's small enough where you have further options, but it, this progressed to a larger lesion which we see here, a much larger lesion, and this would really require an osteochondral graft. Where did they take the graft from? Excuse me, where did they take the graft from? Uh, generally, they're from cadavers. If the, if the lesion's not that big, you can take the graft from the areas where there's not that much con contact in the, in the and then not in their zone. Yeah. Right. Of the femur. There are areas where you can take the graph and, and doesn't cause problems. But if you have a large lesion, lesion then you have to have an allograph. But there are no guarantees on any of them. Yeah. So we have two sagittals of the knee, and it looks like there's uh, grade four chondromalacia in the central weight-bearing portion. Okay. All right. And here, just uh, this is a PD image. See, there's thinning of the articular cartilage there. PD facet, we can see fluid going all the way down to the bone, compatible with grade four. Now, if we go to a T2-weighted image, uh, I think you can see the margins a lot better, typically on T2-weighted images. So the reason that we replace the PD and T1-weighted images in the sagittal plane and uh, uh, put in T2 instead is that with the T2, with the fast spin echo techniques we use, has bright uh, fat, so we get good fat contrast, and we can get much better, more reliable contrast of the margins of the articular cartilage defect uh, with the T2 non-fat suppressed images. Okay. And then uh, here we can see more of a chronic grade four chondromalacia of the patella. And this is all, it's usually associated with intrig, increased uptake on bone scanning, which we really don't do anymore. Another example of grade four chondromalacia of the patella, which we see there, and uh, great areas of multiple grade four chondromalacia. And there's a low field scanner, 0.3 Tesla. Actually, this is a 0.2 Tesla extremity scanner, uh, which really aren't around anymore, where we can see the cartilage defect. I've uh, always felt that the patients that played basketball, and especially the tall, tall ones, that they all would develop countermalacia changes, um, mainly because of the forces and well, uh, you just the, the force of a long bone. Uh, like a, somebody seven feet tall is far greater than somebody who is five foot six or something like that. Right. And these people just get a tremendous amount of force when they jump and so on. Right. Well, why don't we stop here and we'll continue uh, on Tuesday. Uh, uh, Monday, I have to go out of town to a board meeting. So our next lecture will be next Tuesday. Okay. okay. Tuesday sounds a good uh, time, John. Okay, good. For both of us. Right.
All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank Thanks, you. you too.